Hello, my name is Peter Inker. I am the Director of Historical Research and Digital History at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And the title of this talk is The Dissemination of Contextualized Archaeological Data Through Digital Interfaces. So I guess you're asking yourself, what does this title actually mean? Uh, this presentation, I want to explore the question of how, once we've developed a record of archaeological research, be it locked in a building construction or written on paper or any, any format, how do we make these data usable as easily accessible research tools? So what I'm going to do is use examples from Colonial Williamsburg to show how we've tried to contextualize archaeological information by placing it in relation to its original context. Rather than removing it from the original context, we're trying to make it accessible through a range of different digital interfaces. So let's have a little bit of brief context for Williamsburg and Colonial Williamsburg in particular. We are located on the east coast of America, about three hours drive south of Washington, D.C. In the 18th century, Williamsburg was the capital of Britain's largest and most populous colony in the New World, namely Virginia, with a population size of 1,424 people. Today, we are the world's largest living history museum, and annually we have over 500,000 visitors. As well as ticketed guests, we have a large number of unticketed guests, and that is partially due to the open nature of our site. As you can see in this slide, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, is historic area, is based in the middle of Williamsburg itself. Williamsburg's historic area is here shown in red. It's approximately 200 hectares in size, over a kilometer and a half long and a kilometer wide. The city itself does not try to replicate a single year of the 18th century. Instead, each building is restored or reconstructed to the period that we have the most information for for that building. There are 88 buildings that were built in the 18th century that are still standing, with a total of over 500 buildings either restored or reconstructed. This slide shows us the eponymous Frenchman's map that was drawn in 1782 and it gives us the first real understanding of the size and form of the city in the 18th century. And this is the one that we use to begin the reconstruction of the city today. This is the map of Williamsburg in 1926, the year that reconstruction began. Reconstructed buildings were built on the foundations of archaeologically recovered 18th century structures alongside the original 18th century structures that are still standing. This archaeology produced millions of artifacts and much more data besides, which are all captured in over 1,100 research reports, including historical and architectural information. This means we have a lot of data and a lot of artifacts, but how do we access them in a meaningful manner that addresses the theme of this conference? How do we unlock all this information? As I go through the examples of the data in this presentation, I'd like you to think about not the specifics of the uh, representation of the data that I'm showing you, but more about the functionality and how you can adapt this functionality to your own uses. Our first online tool was created to contextualize those 1,100 research reports through a map-based interface. The tool used as its map base, the Frenchman's map mentioned earlier. Digitized research reports were hosted in a public-facing flash-based map overlay. The tags you could see could be toggled on and off to identify locations of reports, including a zoom function on the top right that would detail more complex areas. These titles were also searchable. This shows that one way to access textual information is to directly map it, associating it to the original context of its location. A second phase of this project developed into a project called E. Willemsburg II. Our goal in this tool was to capture the archaeological knowledge base of the environment of Williamsburg, including buildings, property lines, fences, and landscape features. In addition to spatial coordinates, each feature was placed in chronological context, enabling us to observe a snapshot of the city at any point throughout the 18th century. Once these data were captured visually, we also wanted to show that this is not quite as precise an image as it makes out. We needed to capture the level of certainty of each piece of information. How certain were we a building was where it was, chronologically or spatially, at the time? To this end, we have two criteria, temporal uncertainty and spatial uncertainty, and we represented this with color. 
the darker the color, the more certain we were about its origin. This slide shows the criteria we used for recording temporal uncertainty. We had a level of five different options running from unknown to definite. I won't go through all of the detail and hope you can look at this at your own leisure. Similar to the previous slide, this slide shows the levels of uncertainty uh, for spatial data. The end result of this project was eWillemsburg. This was a public-facing GIS interface, which had a zoomable map in the middle of the page, a chronological slider at the bottom that could filter by year, a filter on the top right, which could break the data down by building, property, or owner. Forming the back end of the eWillemsburg project was an SQL database that could log the dates of owners for each lot, each building, and the activities that took place in the buildings. And the map incorporated all of the research report data from the first map. From this, you can see that GIS can be used to present archaeological information contextualized by site spatially as well as chronologically and with inbuilt levels of certainty. This example shows virtual Willemsburg. This is a 3D model, part of the city of Willemsburg, that shows archaeological data sets in 3D context. Virtual Willemsburg has a 3D Unity environment that allows the user to roam the city as we think it looked in 1776. In this view, you can see a photorealistic reconstruction of the loggia of the Capitol building from 1776. This is a high resolution re reconstruction of the room. But these photorealistic renders can distort our understanding of how certain we are about the various elements in the picture. So how do we go about understanding what is real, what is archaeologically recovered, what we are certain or uncertain about? This image shows the same space as the high resolution render, only in a Unity environment. Unity environments mean that we can move around the space in real time. Labels are included to show those things that, where there is data associated with those objects. This makes this environment real-time and queryable, which includes information on objects in context with detailed descriptions as well as hyperlinks to other digital data. This could be any data that has been digitized, so we could link up to it video or sound or text. Much like the maps that we showed you before, we also experimented with certainty in our 3D models. How could we render a 3D model which represents as very certain in a way that could show that we were uncertain about certain elements of it? In this case, you can see the statue from the previous slide has also got a purple head and a blue wireframe hand. The reason behind this is because we were trying to show how the information we had about these two elements was different from the main body of the statue. The head is purple because it was knocked off in the 19th century and significantly damaged. So when we came to reconstruct it, we had the original object, but we also had to do significant reconstruction to it. In the case of the hand, that was removed in the 19th century and has never been discovered. So it had to be completely reconstructed from a single source. So therefore, its certainty was far less than the head. In this next example, we are looking at how we have been merging 3D models with the real world. In this case, the Douglas Theatre, which was excavated in the 1990s and not physically reconstructed in the real world. The virtual model is only complete reconstruction of an 18th century American theatre attempted. And here we tried to contextualize the model with the location of the original building in a real world environment. In this view, we are standing in the west perspective on the previous map, looking towards where the Douglas Theatre was. On the top right is an opacity slider, which if we slide it across, will show the model of the city as it was in 1776. You can see how we've slid it across and now we are looking at the 1776 model of the theatre in its location. And here we've slid it back across to the real world. 
and once again to the model. The goal of this experiment was to show that we could show the 3D virtual models in the real world, so uh, through a phone or an iPod, etc., and being able to reconstruct the buildings virtually as opposed to having to physically reconstruct them. This means we can literally take our archaeological data and place it within the original context that was uncovered, and also our interpretive reconstructions. I'd like to show you now the final example of the work we've been doing here at the Colonial Williamsburg. This is another 360 degree walkthrough, much like the theater example previously. In the final online version, you'll be able to look up, down, left and right, or if you're using an iPad or phone, you'll be able to move your phone around to actually move the image in real time. Embedded within the 360 video, is a series of icons, which I'll go through now. The camera icon has embedded video footage, so we try to contextualize some of the people or stories of the building or the room into this area. On the top right, you can see some muskets, which has a 3D icon on it. By clicking that, we can pop up a 3D model. By clicking on that icon, we can pop up a 3D model of a pistol, which is itself in a 3D environment, so can be examined, zoomed in, zoomed out, and rotated. The circular objects in the doorway are the navigation tool that will enable you to move from space to space. See, the icon also shows the name of the room that we will be moving into, and by clicking on it, you can move into the next room. In this case, we've moved into the hallway, and there's another icon which we can click on and move into the ballroom. Here in the ballroom, you can see how we've navigated through a number of rooms just using those circular icons. And then we have the also have more icons in here where we can click open models, text, videos, etc. In this way, we are embedding lots of our digital data into real world environments. Finally, by clicking on the labels on the bottom of the screen, we can call up a panorama list which shows all of the rooms in the building and we can navigate to them just using this panel. Well, hopefully this brief overview of some of the projects that the Kelowna Willemsburg Foundation has been working on has shown you some strategies where we can capture documentation of all forms as long as it's digitized and represent them in 2D and 3D environments. These digital interfaces can be used as tools not only to directly read the physical world, but also to show variation of interpretation of evidence, and also to show how certain or uncertain we are about our reconstructions. I think you can see there is a lot of opportunity to create digital interfaces that can present all sorts of archaeological research data in interesting and meaningfully contextualized ways. Thank you.